Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Mark Hamrick, a broadcast journalist with the Associated Press, and I'm the 104th president of the National Press Club. I'd like to welcome our club members and their guests here in the audience today, as well as those of you watching live on C-SPAN and listening over any variety of broadcast audiences. I'd also like to remind our audience that members of the public are in attendance here today, so if you hear applause by chance, it's not necessarily evidence that our journalist members have checked their impartiality at the door. Now, before we get started with our special guest today, I want to thank Jennifer Schonberger from Kiplinger's, who's over here uh, on our front row. She's a member of our speakers committee who did an excellent job bringing today's event together. Thank you very much, Jennifer. As we all know, America is facing the worst jobs crisis since the Great Depression. The official unemployment rate stands at 9.1 percent. The so-called real unemployment rate, which includes discouraged workers, is a little over 16 percent. And of the unemployed, 30 percent have been out of work for more than a year. The percentage of American adults in the workforce has dropped to 58 percent, and we're told that's the lowest rate since 1983. So Labor Day is right around the corner. Our guest kindly sits down today with us as the unemployment landscape continues to sh change. A lack of useful skills for new jobs is helping to create a larger pool of unemployed workers. Unions are fighting to maintain their position in the labor force while their public image is said to be at a near all-time low. According to the Pew Research Center poll, Americans believe unions have a positive influence on their salaries, their benefits, and their working conditions, but they don't think that unions contribute to productivity or the ability of U.S. companies to compete around the world. And the political season is heating up. I don't have to tell any of you that. Republicans are vying for their party's nomination, and they're hitting the administration hard. For example, Republican Texas Governor Rick Perry said one in six work-eligible Americans cannot find a full-time job. That is not economic recovery, he said. That is economic disaster. The administration has talked about the presiding during the creation of 2.4 million jobs but 14 million people remain unemployed. And we now know that the administration is working on details of a plan to spur job growth with an expected announcement by the president after Labor Day. Secretary Solis is no newcomer to Washington before becoming Labor Secretary. She served in the House for eight years, where her initiatives included affordable health care, protecting the environment, and improving the lives of working families. As an advocate for clean energy jobs, she authored the Green Jobs Act in Congress, which provided funding for job training for veterans, displaced workers, and families in poverty. Before coming to Washington, she served in the California State Assembly and in 1994 made history by becoming the first Hispanic woman elected to the California State Senate. A first-generation American, our guest father was a Teamsters Union shop steward from Mexico who worked at a battery recycling plant, and her mother from Nicaragua was an assembly line worker for Mattel, also a union member. As Labor Secretary, she helped implement major facets of the administration's American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. That included increasing and extending unemployment benefits, providing training for workers in need of new skills, and helping to create jobs in clean energy and health information technology. And uh, we don't want to overlook the fact that in the year 2000, she was awarded the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award, which is said to be presented annually to public servants who have made courageous decisions of conscience without regard for the personal or professional consequences. So first of all, I'd ask our audience to please give a warm, traditional round of applause to our speaker today, Labor Secretary Hilda Solis. <laughs> Secretary, thank you for sitting down with us at this important time. It's an important week. As we noted, uh, we have the holiday uh, coming up on Monday. We have what we call uh, in the uh, business and financial field numbers day on Friday, which is the monthly unemployment statistics. And as we know, the president, uh, both yesterday and today, has been referencing uh, ways to help uh, cure what seems to be a much more uh, substantial unemployment problem than maybe many of us had expected that would be persistent this long after the uh, financial crisis. So we know the president is going to make a speech uh, of some kind, and I presume that you have been uh, working very closely with him and uh, the White House on uh, that plan. Uh, there have been some drips and drabs coming out on that. What can you tell us about uh, what we can expect at this point? Well, Mark, I don't certainly want to go ahead of the president and the drips and you know inkling of information that comes out. 
I think uh, the public is, is aware that the president is very concerned about job creation, as well as I am. I mean, that's been our priority since day one. Um, and I think we've learned in the last two and a half years uh, what will work, what can work. And one of the things that he's talked about already was extending the payroll uh, tax that uh, will help millions of people and help put some discretionary funding uh, out there that will help spur uh, some job creation. That's one part of it. The other would be to extend the unemployment insurance benefit program that helps to provide a safety net for millions of people who are still looking for jobs. And I have a lot of empathy for those five workers to one job that are looking for entry into the workforce. We can't, uh, we can't fault them. They lost their jobs through no fault of their own. And we owe them uh, as much support as we can to help them transition into new jobs. So it's very important that unemployment insurance be used as a, as a tool that can help people uh, reinvent themselves, get retrained, get new certification, and be able to find the means of getting into that, to that job. And then the other thing I would say is very important to the many people that have been laid off in the construction and trades industry is the infrastructure bank. And that isn't a new idea. That's something that's been talked about for, for a long time. Even as a former member of the House, I recall bipartisan support uh, on that issue. It shouldn't be about Democrats and Republicans. It should be about Americans getting back to work and helping with that recovery. So that infrastructure bank is going to be critical in helping us maintain uh, our roads, we, and we're seeing it right now with what happened with Hurricane uh, Irene, where we know that we have an, an aging infrastructure. We can put people back to work, create incentives for job development, draw down public and private sector funding to help restore and rebuild our infrastructure, but put people back to work. Those are good paying jobs, good middle class jobs. So let's take it from the top. You talked about the extension of the payroll tax. So that is simply, is, is that not just a continuation of the status quo? I mean, extending a program that already exists? Well, we know that um, it's, it's a, a program that worked. I mean, we know shortly after December when that agreement was, uh, was made between the President and the House and the Congress uh, that we saw as a result in, in uh, the first part of the year where jobs were, were coming back. And uh, you know, there's a whole series of other things that I think were attributed there. Um, and I think those are positive signs. Then the infrastructure bank, I know I think Senator Kerry was uh, a, a sponsor of that, but it, and that, you know, that, may, that idea makes the rounds, but it may not be coffee table conversation in many households. Can, so can you explain to us essentially how that works? Well, I would say that uh, what's really important here is to understand that there is uh, a large uh, number of individuals that represent uh, very key sectors of, of our economy, and that's the building and construction and trades. In addition to engineers and architects, accountants, uh, individuals who are tied into that industry, into infrastructure. So we're also talking about the restoration of bridges, highways, high-speed rail, major invest investments in our, in our corridors where we find that perhaps if we could ship goods and services in a better way, that will help also uh, impact our economy and, and hopefully increase um, the marketability of our products getting one place to another, but getting people from home to work and vice versa, and allowing for aged uh, structures to be retrofitted. And in many cases, the incentive will be to, to retrofit them in a new, uh, how can I say, with new technology, renewable energy, new types of resources that should be utilized. So I'm a big believer, as, as you said earlier, I was the author of the Green uh, Jobs Act that was passed uh, in the former administration, but wasn't funded. This time around, in the last two and a half years, I'm very proud to say that this president helped us make those investments so that we could really uh, retrain people in renewable energy. And I think, look at states like California, the Southwest, and even in Maine and other parts of the country where you see the growth of new industries coming to bear. And if we continue to make those key investments, training people appropriately, I think we're, we're gonna hopefully uh, see a good stabilization in our, in our uh, economic situation and, and make us more competitive. I think about what's happening in Brazil. Think about what's happening in China and India and other folks that are so, making so many advancements in these areas in renewable energy. And it's taken us this long. And it's, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be that way. I think that we're ready to take on that next major step. And some cities and states are already doing it. 
So there are lessons to be learned, and I think it, that uh, the path that the president has laid out is very positive. So just a little bit more specifically on the idea of an infrastructure bank, is the idea to draw in private investment to help Both. finance right. these infrastructure improvements? Bonds would be put out and then obviously uh, give opportunities for contractors, developers, and individuals who want to make those kinds of investments. And hopefully uh, we know that those are, that's a very affordable way of, of uh, getting uh, structures up and built but also uh, engaging the, the private sector. Obviously, this isn't, a, this isn't something that's, that's just being led by the federal government. So we need all partners, so local, state, city government, everyone, private sector, folks that want to make those investments. I think it's a great opportunity. And there will be a potential of who knows how many millions of jobs created. Uh, the president on the road today talking about one of the key priorities, I guess, for when, he comes, when the Congress comes back is to push ahead for uh, a tax credit to help employ uh, veterans, uh, an astonishing number of whom are actually unemployed after giving uh, service to their country. Uh, how does that work exactly? Well, it's an incentive to hire up uh, our returning vets, uh, vets that are coming back, say, from service uh, less than six months, a, a small business owner or medium size or a large business uh, owner can uh, give them a job and, and receive a tax credit and the amount for those that have been unemployed less than six months would be about I believe twenty four hundred dollars and then it get it's double if they've been out of work longer than six months so obviously that is an incentive to get these young uh, folks that are coming back uh, returning uh, not finding success right now but to have a job and that's the least that we can do we need to do much much more as well and and, and the president talked about that today at his uh, speech before the American Legion about um, making sure that we honor our commitment to those returning men and women who've served us. Many that uh, uh, didn't, didn't maybe quite understand that they were going to be serving our country for three and four tours. Mm -hmm. And it's had a devastating impact on their families and the uh, White House and, and even our department, our vets division has done much work now in opening up opportunities so the private sector will hire our returning vets and give them those opportunities, and especially those that are disabled, because I think that is, that is going to be something that we all uh, should take very seriously and know that, that it's something that is constantly on our minds and that we want to address and we want to make sure that we bring all the resources to bear to help those veterans. You were a member of Congress, as we said from the outset. Uh, you were in the California uh, legislature. and. Uh, that means that perhaps unlike some other members of the cabinet who come to Washington straight from the private sector, you've been uh, well educated in how the political world works, for better or for worse, right? So uh, we've obviously seen uh, an almost unprecedented uh, bifurcated uh, debate uh, surrounding the debt ceiling, uh, which wasn't comforting to a lot of people and discomforting to many. Uh, when you're looking at the priorities the administration's putting out there and that you're working to hone, What's the reasonable expectation that any of these things can actually get through before an election? Well, I'll tell you, it's been an, inter it's been an interesting experience sitting in the um, executive branch uh, and watching uh, what, is ha what is happening uh, in the Congress. And it is something that is uh, highly uh, unusual in terms of uh, the polarization that I see that I've seen because uh, there were many occasions where we would uh, be able to travel and spend time with members on the other side of the aisle. In fact, um, I served as a, uh, my first year in the House on the Education and Workforce Committee under uh, Chairman Boehner. I had a very good, very interesting relationship. Got along with you know people across the aisle. Uh, you didn't have to always agree on issues, but where you could find agreement. You worked, and, and our ranking member at the time was Chairman Miller. Um, and I learned, I learned quite a bit. We got a lot done, and when we saw that there were challenges for both sides, we could work them out and think rationally through that process. I don't know what has happened since then, except that there's this big gap. And I know that the public is very frustrated. I'm very frustrated because I know that there are members of the House from, from both sides that want to see things accomplished. The urgency is to make sure that we create jobs, I believe, now, and also to be able to make, um, make whole 
many communities that, uh, that really need this help uh, urgently. And, and I think about the Northeast. I think about the automobile industry that was impacted and what's happened there. I think about the uh, home builders. I think about folks that are in foreclosure. I think about education and training and the challenges that we're, that we're facing. Uh, and, and I remember serving on the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, talking about not just health care reform, but also this whole initiative to really bring out more change in terms of access to different forms of media through broadband, but making sure that we did not leave any neighborhood or rural community behind. And we had a lot of arguments going back and forth about how that should happen. But I still believe that uh, a role in Congress, the role that I had and that I continue to think is very important, is to make sure that we try to, to balance our approaches. And, and I don't know that, um, that many people in Congress are thinking that way at this time. It may, it may be because people have never served before or don't have a, an exact uh, understanding about how government functions. And that couldn't be a part of it because even not understanding the budgetary process can be complicated for members. And if you have staff that aren't there to help prepare and, and make sure that you're making the right decisions, you know, sometimes that can have consequences. Um, I hope that people will be able to come together and do the right thing because there is an urgency to get our economy working for everybody. And I, and I just underscore that, everybody. Well, I mean, so I, I have to think that at some levels of the government right now, there's an assessment being made of what can reasonably be passed, right? In other words, you're trying to figure out what the political landscape is. Uh, what, what do you, where do you see the areas that Republicans and Democrats can reasonably be expected to agree on these? Well, kinds of I would hope that the infrastructure uh, bank, you know, that whole concept of really helping to restore uh, aging facilities might be something that immediately would draw the attention of members on both sides of the aisle. I know, I believe the chairman of the Transportation Committee, um, Chairman Mika, I think has in the past supported those kinds of efforts and I have to believe that we're really talking about communities that have, uh, in this one instance, this hurricane, just showing you what, what devastation can occur, occur across the country in areas um, that, for lack of a better description, um, are, are somewhat conservative and may need federal assistance at this time. So let's think about it in, in, in terms of trying to help uh, areas that need immediate attention and help look at long-term planning so that we don't run into situations where you have aging bridges that all of a sudden collapse or our rail systems that can't now transport our goods and services from one port to another. And I think about those things all the time, having come from a state like California, where we have all kinds of commerce, where one slip of, uh, say, uh, a bad decision on a, a railroad uh, line or crossing can devastate communities if things are not appropriately cared for and handled and we don't have appropriate means to, to continue to make sure that things operate appropriately and safely. Those are things that uh, I think that members across the aisle can agree on, that they need our attention. There doesn't seem to be much disagreement on the notion that the job market needs help. The question is, of course, how to go about that. And there are people who at one end of the spectrum say the government needs to be as far out of the equation as possible, and there's others that say it needs to be more aggressive, and somewhere there's in between. Uh, upcoming luncheon at the press club will be Ron Paul. I think I know where he stands on all that. Uh, but it'll be interesting to hear his uh, views. Uh, we had Michelle Bachman, who's a presidential uh, nomination uh, candidate, uh, somewhat uh, taking a, a similar viewpoint. Uh, where do you put yourself on the proper mix of government and the private sector generally when you're looking at these solutions? Well, I work for the government, <laughs> number one. Uh, and my role is to help facilitate uh, access to employment opportunities. We run 3,000 uh, what we call one-stop job centers around the country. And so this has been going on for some time to try to get people into our doors, connected to a business or an industry to get trained up. Um, I look at my job as one as trying to help enhance, not to be a barrier, but to one to, to help provide access, choices, and opportunities. And many people are are befuddled by what the Department of Labor does 
because we're not just exclusively in an enforcement agency. However, we are the second largest in the federal government compared to Department of, of Justice. We're number two. Um, but our role is also, also to facilitate investments. So if I have someone that I meet that's interested in, in uh, trying to train their employees or attract em employees in, say, a technological area, say, in pharmaceuticals, um, our one-stop centers can help post those openings even train, collaborate with uh, some of our partnerships, our community colleges or our technical schools that we work with, and provide the training so that we can meet the needs of that employer. That's what we need to do better, a better job at, and we're doing it now. And I've seen in the last two and a half years a more, uh, how could I say, precise way of, of figuring that out. Because it's taken a while for, for the government, so to speak, to really understand that the priorities are making sure that we're connecting with the businesses that we're actually not um, training people for jobs that don't exist, but for jobs that will make their employees or potential employees competitive. And you hear a lot about, well, the workforce isn't trained well, and we have all these jobs open. I'll tell you one thing. There's so many people uh, in terms of those that haven't been able to find jobs, and many are very highly skilled. You have PhDs, you've got scientists, you've got architects, engineers, you've got a whole slew of well-trained people. But the jobs that they, can, that they are seeking, um, they, they may not be available right now. So what that tells me is we better start investing in a whole new source of jobs and hopefully making investments, as I said earlier, in renewable energy, uh, IT, broadband, healthcare. These are all, all areas that are growing by leaps and bounds. And I see that there will be a future there. But likewise, also bringing back some of that manufacturing base and bringing those jobs back here. One example is the creation of uh, lithium batteries and putting new and smarter cars out there with GM and Chrysler now competing with uh, the foreign markets and seeing the reality of uh, formerly laid off, dislocated workers now being put back to work, now creating new systems. Same methodology, but now applying new systems and being a part of that management and labor partnership. And I saw it on the ground when I went out in Ohio, saw it in Detroit, saw it around different places in Tennessee and other parts of the country where I think these are, are stories that have to be told to the public and to our elected officials, that there are some good, uh, good things that come out of um, the, ne the negative aspects of, of uh, the fiscal crisis. It, it creates a challenge for us, and it's one that is stubborn, it's hard. But I'm, I'm committed and the President's committed to see that we put people into uh, the best fit for them. Let me ask you though, Secretary, there's a perception uh, that people express that the President's priority was more about deficit reduction than it was on getting jobs created and that he's only recently turned around on that. Is that accurate? I don't think so at all. I mean, <laughs> for the last two and a half years, we've been making majors, major investments, as I said, in training for a new workforce in renewable energy and in healthcare and IT and broadband, and also training up individuals. We still need, um, this, this struck me as something very interesting when I was out in the field about a year and a half ago, that there were many small manufacturers, tool makers, who told me, you know, Secretary, it would be great if I could have just an average Joe that could help me uh, develop um, and continue with the development of our, of our industry, tool making, tool making. So welders, the old jobs that people are, are not prioritizing right now, we have a shortage of highly skilled people in those industries. And I've seen uh, where if appropriate investments are made, you can bring back that industry and we can compete across the world. In fact, I saw this happening at Vikings, um, at a, an operation that's run by Vikings, one of the largest manufacturers of tool bits, tool bits learned a lot about it, <laughs> and found that uh, through assistance that they rece received through uh, federal government, some, some investments, but also private investments that were made, they were able to retool their factory, um, actually take old machinery that was unused, that was maybe 50 years old, take it all the way down to the bottom, rebuild it, create a whole new dynamic, and are now creating new bits that are being sold around the country. Now they have more shifts ongoing. They've also, because of investments, have reduced their energy consumption. They're saving money there. 
They're also recycling, they're conserving, and they're retraining. They're sending some of their folks to some of our neighboring partnership uh, schools. So people can't tell me that it can't be done, that we can't retool our workers in some of these older traditional jobs, as well as creating opportunities for those that are looking into the future. Someone asked, uh, can the U.S. Uh, job market grow in a robust way without having manufacturing lead the way, in your opinion? I think manufacturing is definitely uh, a major cornerstone for our economy. And it has helped so many people in the past stay in the middle class. And I know there have been some changes in the past, but I, I do believe that there's this, this interest now and, and, you know, I'm just talk, talking hypothetically here from, from what I've seen, but people are feeling a sense that, you know, we've got to invest in our country. We've got to invest in our best resource, and that's our human capital. That's retraining and training people here and making products here and selling them abroad. That's why the president's talked about these trade uh, agreements, to be able to sell our products, our automobiles, our agro, our, our pharmaceutical our technology and send them abroad to help lift up those economies. So I'm, I'm for that. I think, that's, I think that's something that's very real. And the president and I, we're all working together and something that we want to see accomplished. I think the other side of the aisle has talked about that as well. Now they have an opportunity to, to help. But that's a good example, isn't it, that we've t there's been a push for trade agreements to be passed even recently. And uh, in this political environment that we talked about earlier, we can't even seem to find uh, agreement on, on those points. Is that discouraging to you when you see that? To a certain extent it is, but you have to know what you're dealing with. <laughs> and I think that uh, we, we remain very uh, committed that these agreements uh, move forward. And the president knows that part of our success will be the kinds of products that we can sell abroad. And that, you know, obviously that's going to have a tremendous impact. That's going to drive markets in whole, in whole new areas, hopefully help a lot of our farmers and agribusiness, all kinds of industries that can benefit. But meanwhile, also making sure that we're mindful of our, of our labor protections and, and keeping our standards where they should be. So those are, those, are, those are two goals that I think come out of the whole, you know, trade discussion. I mean, I think it'd be interesting to know uh, to the degree that you can describe it. How does the dynamic work, let's say, between you and your department and the White House in terms of driving the employment agenda? Uh, are, you, are you well aligned on that? Uh, or in your position being Labor Secretary, do you have to sometimes uh, step up the voice a little bit uh, to say, hey, you know, don't forget about us. Uh, we know there are wars out there. The Defense Department has to be concerned with. We know Homeland Security is concerned about keeping the nation safe, but uh, there's a lot of people out there who are hurting. How does that dynamic work in the conversations that you have with the administration? To be quite honest, I'm very pleased with the communication and dialogue that we have with the White House. Um, I, you know, for the first time in a long time, am so happy to work for this president. And I've met many presidents um, and worked, you know, many years ago um, in the White House, but in a, at a different level, obviously. Uh, but thinking about the ability to sit with uh, pr the president and talk about policies and what I see out in the field and sharing that with him and his staff, uh, I think is very, very legitimate and very, um, very welcome. And I have to say that much of what um, I think I bring to the table are, are exactly what the president wants. He wants honesty. He wants to know what, what um, in our analysis, is, is better served for the public. And he wants to know how, how quickly we can get things done. And I am very, uh, I'm very pleased with the relationship that he personally has uh, with members of the cabinet, but with myself. Um, this is the first time. Uh, I see myself in a very, very unique situation. Um, I'm also the first Latina cabinet member ever in the history of this country. So I, I think about that, not, not as uh, 
something that, you know, puts me in a different category. No. It, it's allowing for more people to see that there's a vision in this White House that allows for different ideas and different individuals to serve. And while I didn't attend perhaps all the uh, prep schools and you know, all those different formalities that other individuals uh, have, have been exposed to, I bring, a, I bring a different experience, but one that um, has served people in, in public service. And the president, being the first African-American president, is, is uh, quite an accomplishment, don't you think? Well, I'd say you both have something to brag about. And uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, you're able to make that point for us. Would you, would you expect, if the president's reelected, that you'll continue to serve as labor secretary? That's entirely up to our president. I serve at his will. Well, he doesn't control your expectations. <laughs> Well, I enjoy working uh, for him and representing um, this administration. It has really been an exciting time, I think, for, for some of us to serve because the needs are so profound and so great. Um, and people have often asked me, why did you take this job at this time, knowing that unemployment was so high? You know, that wasn't the first driver of why I decided to do this. I did it because this is a historic moment in time for us. And I think my country needs, needs um, individuals who are going to think a little differently, but with the same kind of uh, enthusiasm and patriotism to want to help our entire country and hopefully be able to set a good example. And I think that that's probably one of the greatest things um, you know, that I could say that I've, that I've experienced in just this short time. We're not even through our first term yet. Right. It's only two and a half, two and a half years. You talked earlier about, in a sense, what you have in common with the president. It seems as if through the experience of the last several months, as, you know, poll numbers go up and down or down and up, that some Americans feel like they don't know who the president really is, that they have a sense that they had uh, they thought they knew him uh, during the election to be one thing, uh, and obviously I'm speaking in generalities, but I'm basing it on what some of the polls have told us and anecdotes have told us, and that uh, sometimes there does, there's a desire on the parts of some people to see a president who's more passionate. And I can think about when he was talking about the BP oil spill, where I think he used some colorful language about you know, making sure that people were brought uh, to bear for their responsibility for that. Uh, since you've had an opportunity to see the president in both private and public settings, who is President Barack Obama? What, what is he really made of? He's and I really very, do, I ask the question very, seriously, in all seriousness. Uh, he, I think he's a very uh, passionate, compassionate, and also very uh, intelligent human being. One that will listen and will take the time to better understand issues and problems and want to hear everybody out, regardless of, you know, what authority you might bring to bear. Um, and I respect that. Um, and I also see him, uh, an individual who cares very deeply about this country and has inspired many, many people. So here in Washington, you know, it's really easy for us to get lost and to think that, gee, just because all the networks or cable, you know, TV folks are saying this or that, that that's the rule of the day. But when I go out in the communities that I visit, and I spend a lot of time out across this country, I'm hearing more about, you know, gee, it's nice to know that, um, that you all are, are focusing in on helping us create jobs to get the job training or to get that assistance that I need so that I can continue to look for a job through UI benefits, or recently, let me give you an example. I visited a reservation in Arizona, uh, a, a group of individuals that have been serving a community that has suffered from high unemployment for, for decades, maybe 40% unemployment. And their means of assistance through our programs was helping to provide job training in the area of health care and, and in renewable energy. and giving some semblance of hope for these individuals. 
And while our funding wasn't the major source that they received, they were very grateful and thankful. And they um, were very kind and very, uh, how could I say, very proud. And they, they didn't necessarily want, um, how could I say, handouts. They wanted a hand up and assistance. So I see that as very, very important. Uh, in, in what I see out there and what people believe and what they see. And I do believe that the American public, because they are very resilient, we have that can-do spirit about us, regardless of what situation you're in. And I've seen it from those that are at the very bottom, some that are in the middle, and some were, that were in the middle that have now fallen down for the first time. And let me tell you how horrifying that can be for families. So what I see, I know the president sees as well. So I can tell you that um, he's a very, very um, sensitive individual. And um, everyone has their different style, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I do respect him greatly and for the people that he has brought together to serve uh, in this administration. And you don't hear a lot about that. A lot about that. Um, and sometimes it's about making sure that people get the services that they need. The president made a good point to us once at a cabinet meeting. He says, you know, if I didn't call you in as a cabinet member, that's good. Because I don't have a problem with you. You're doing your job. You're getting the services out. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And to me, it makes so much sense. Speaking of people he brings to serve, uh, yesterday he announced that a former chief economist of the Labor Department, I believe it was before uh, you were secretary there, is now his choice to be uh, the head of his Council of Economic Advisors. And some people were making um, the point that, well, he's a labor economist, therefore that means this, that, or the other thing. Does the, is there any particular importance to the background of um, Alan Kruger that means this is where the president's priorities are for at least the remainder of his first term? I, I know Alan. We've worked uh, together on different issues when he was in Treasury. Um, I respect him greatly. Um, I think he will provide and continue to provide good leadership and counsel to the President and to his economic team and to us and to others. And I look forward to working with him. Um, I think he'll bring uh, a depth uh, that um, a greater understanding about what our economic situation is and how to help remedy. Uh, that, uh, and I think that it will, be, it will be great. And I know that the president is, we urgently need these positions filled. So I would hope that the Congress and Senate, who will make uh, their voices heard, and some are already, that they truly understand uh, the role that, that he will play and, and has played in, in previous administrations, because he did serve, even at the Department of Labor, he was chief economist there. Um, I know him as a very intelligent and very thoughtful uh, and very highly respected individual. Would you be dismissive of those who are suggesting that the appointment of someone who has Labor Department experience means anything about where the President's agenda is going? Or is, it, is, it, is this merely continuation of what the President has, has been intending all along? I, I'm not one to predict what the President, <laughs> you know, I think that, uh, as I said, I, I can just base my, my um, opinion on what I know, and he is a highly talented, uh, highly intelligent individual who served us well, and hopefully will continue in this in this new capacity and be and be able to help us immediately uh, begin to attack this problem of, of high uh, unemployment and help to provide a better balance in our economic um, uh, endeavors. And I think that he'll do a good job. We mentioned at the outset, Friday's Numbers Day. You have the unemployment rate and the uh, payrolls numbers, among others, being released. I know that's always a big day uh, for you and uh, for those who are following these numbers. Uh, today, for example, we had some consumer confidence numbers that weren't just bad, they were horrible. And, and they may have been reflecting the situation with the, the uh, debt debate. We don't know exactly how all that uh, played into it. but. As one who's interviewed you really from the beginning of the administration on a monthly basis, I, I would say that you've been very consistent, and I'm just trying to be fair here, I think you've been very consistent with never wanting to raise expectations that the recovery was going to be particularly easy. And that um, I remember one month, I think there was an outsized 
gain in payrolls numbers, and you were sort of like, you know, don't look for this for the next three months kind of a thing. So at this point, do you feel like you've seen all along that this is going to be a slow and steady process, whereas, as you've said yourself, many Americans right now are frustrated, and that's showing up in uh, mm -hmm. some of the poll numbers? Well, I know that um, this is a really tough recession We're coming out in, in now in the recovery because we have added 2.4 uh, million private sector jobs. And, and while that amount may seem small, it needs to be higher, definitely. But where we've come out of, I think people have to understand, when the president began his job, we had already lost close to you know, 4 million. And then on top of that, in February, as soon as I came on board around that time, another, I mean, we came out another 4 million. So we lost you know, 8 million jobs. We were losing uh, over 700,000 jobs at the beginning of, of his administration. Now we're adding, while it might be smaller, we're seeing contraction in our, in our economy and in different sectors. Some sectors are doing really well. Silicon Valley, pharmaceuticals, some of these highly uh, technical areas are the ones that are helping to continue to move our, our economy. And I see that continuing at that, you know, at that level. Therefore, we need to start bringing and making those changes that we need to bring people along so that we have better skilled, better trained, more competitive uh, individuals, and that we're actually competing with our other uh, friends from other countries like China and India and Brazil and other places. And we need to make those hard choices. And some people are of the mindset that, no, they don't want to go in that direction. And, and that's kind of the forces that we have to contend with. But I am, I am cautious. I'm not, an, I'm not an economist. But I, I know that I can only base my judgment on what reports I'm given through the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So I, I make my assessment based on what has happened. And the pattern in the past 17 months has, has shown me that we've been able to create 2.4 million private sector jobs. And they've been in these manufacturing. They've been in um, health care. We've seen them in uh, business and professions. And you know there are, there are different sectors that have, have actually uh, been able to improve. One that I worry about a bit is the uh, public sector, local government, and teaching. Because if we want to remain competitive, uh, we need to be very mindful that we don't just release and allow for a lot of our teachers especially the young teachers that we're trying to bring in uh, to slowly be dissuaded and not um, want to stay in, t in the teaching profession. We need good teachers. And we need young, vibrant teachers. We need to also take care of those teachers that have been serving us well and uh, make sure that we do the right thing to help increase the ability for our young people who desire to go to college to have access to go to college and to be able to have the tools and training available to them. And right now, education is suffering. We know that. And I see it. Um, and we work a lot with community colleges right now. Many of them, and I know I look back at my own state of California, where their uh, budgets have been shrinking. But we can't afford to not make those investments. So we have to be mindful of where we're going, where our path is. And that path, if we take the right path, will take us down the line where we're better prepared, better educated. And, and ready to make uh, and meet those challenges. Uh, but when you talk about make those investments, the federal government isn't in a position to fund state and local governments anymore, is it? At, to, at, to, at a greater degree than it is already? I don't think we're going to see uh, stimulus too, <laughs> if you're asking right. that. But I do think that the things that we talked about earlier, the infrastructure bank, very important, and immediate uh, remedies to help alleviate the distress that is being experienced by many families and extending unemployment, the payroll tax, all those things are going to be helpful. Um, and I, I would just hope that we can, we can get to the business of the people that we represent and want to help. So another person that's taking some political fire is uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke, who's uh, criticized probably uh, as much from the Republican side as he is from the Democrats anymore. Uh, at the Fed meeting earlier this month, essentially the Fed came out and said, we're going to have persistent unemployment for the next two years. Did that seem surprising? Were you disappointed when you heard that, that the Fed would say, essentially, give up hope 
that the unemployment rate is going to go down, uh, frankly, before the election? Well, Mark, I don't think he said give up hope. I don't give up hope, and I know you don't. And I, and I feel very strongly that, um, that uh, again, going back to what I see out in the field around the country, people's resiliency and wanting to get up. Just imagine if it was you. You were laid off, your job went away, and no one ever called you back, and now all of a sudden you've got, you've got to figure out what to do. And you get up every morning to go find that job. And you find resistance, and you find that uh, the employer is not calling you back, or no one is going to accept you, um, and, and it's tough. But yet, you get up every morning because you know you have to. There are millions of people that are feeling like that right now. And you know what? I'm not going to give up hope. Well, I, I perhaps misspoke when I said that, because he's no one's spiritual advisor. But, but I, think what, <laughs> I think what he was saying was, this is the reality. And, and when you have someone who speaks that can move markets in a minute, saying, you know, I do not expect, or we do not as a central bank expect the job market to be improved. I mean, did that come as a surprise when, when the Fed came out and said that to you? What didn't surprise me is what he said, is that it's the job of the Congress now and our leaders to make some decisions and to break the gridlock. That is what's important. And I think that is what the public and everyone is watching from around the world to see what's going to happen. And, and I believe that the president is ready, and he said he's ready to meet, meet those demands and to work until this is resolved, take care of our debt, uh, but also making sure that we don't hurt uh, the economic recovery. And uh, I mean, I'd like to just remind people that in the previous administration, we were adding on an average, I think it's about 11,000 jobs per month. And I can tell you that in the short time that I've been with this president, we've added uh, on an average far above and beyond that. And 2.4 million jobs is not where it should be. But let me tell you, we have worked really hard to make sure that we increase the opportunity. So what well, we have a long ways to go, Mark. But you, you know, people have to understand uh, where we started and where we're going. And that path tells me, you know, I hear from other economists too, that they see, uh, um, um, that they do see the path that the president has taken as one that has been, has been well thought out, developed, given the restraints and constraints that we're faced with, and both political as well as other structural problems that we're faced with. Let me ask you about the holiday upcoming, Labor Day. Uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, I mean, there's a wide uh, divergence of uh, opinion among members of the American public now about unions, and we've seen that, as you know, borne out in debates in state capitals in places like uh, Wisconsin and Ohio, uh, very recently recall elections involving that process in uh, Wisconsin as well. As Labor Secretary, do you feel as if you're an advocate for all workers, all potential workers, including members of labor unions? And how do you balance that when you have essentially all the potential workers out in the American public seeming to have a rather angry debate about where the role that unions should play? Well, first of all, as uh, Labor Secretary, we represent all workers. So that's number one. And that is very, that's very important, especially for those folks that are that are workers that have you know, been dislocated. Um, that's very important to all of us. Um, we, represent, you know, we represent everyone. And obviously, uh, I support individuals who choose to be a part of a union and those that don't. I mean, that's my role. Um, and I have to be very fair uh, and objective in, in how we run our programs. And, you know, making sure that, that uh, across the board there's a balance. And I think that's what we've been able to do. And all you have to do is look to see the kinds of things we, where we've made our investments in, in terms of our, our federal funding. And we want to continue to raise standards of our programs so that we do a better job. My sense is that some people uh, don't mind the ideas that unions have helped them or the accomplishments that 
they have helped Americans to attain, like a 40-hour work week mm -hmm. or the right to a minimum wage sure. uh, or overtime. But when they see some union members that they perceive have greater benefits than they do, especially if they're uh, state or uh, unionized uh, government workers, that they become resentful. And that seems to be what's driving some of what's been happening lately. So when you see a state that has a debate over trying to take away uh, collective bargaining uh, rights for some workers, uh, and yet it's potential workers or people who are already employed but aren't re represented by unions who are pushing that agenda forward, H how would you weigh in on that debate? Well, um, first and foremost, I think that we're, we're concerned uh, when, when there are um, issues that arise, like in Wisconsin and Ohio. I, I know that uh, that's been a big debate. A lot of states are faced with some financial crisis right now. They're operating in the red. Um, and we know that there are challenges. Uh, I would just continue to say that it's, it's good if uh, both sides can meet at the table and decide uh, in the best interests of, of uh, the public and themselves and what they're charged with doing to be able to work those differences out, but face to face. Not one overruling the other, but sitting down and having that kind of a conversation. And I think that's what the president and I believe in, that you should, you should be able to negotiate. And I know that unions, especially public sector unions and, and others in other sectors, um, have given up a lot in the past few years. In fact, some members will give up uh, salary increases and bonuses just to keep their health care benefits. I've seen that time and time again. But you don't hear a lot about that. Right. And so I think that sacrifices can be made and have been made, but you can't just uh, hold one group responsible for the demise of, of say, a whole state. Um, that's, that's not what this is about, and that's not how that happened. So you shouldn't be blaming a, a group of people in that manner. We realize that there have to be compromises. I understand that. The president understands that. But let's do it rationally. Let's do it at the table. Let me just try to knock out a few questions from the audience real quick. Uh, should U.S., and maybe if you want to answer these as concisely as you can, uh, even more so than you normally would, that would be fine. Uh, should U.S. workplace laws cover both le legal and illegal workers? Are you concerned about encouraging illegals to work here in the United States? Our current uh, laws, federal laws, protect all workers in this country. Previous administrations, both Republican and Democrat, have held to that. So I'm not doing anything different. And my uh, priority right now is to make sure that, that we enforce our laws appropriately and that we help uh, businesses and employees understand what their rights are uh, and what the expectations are, and also assist businesses to better understand that they also have a responsibility. Uh, when, when they do uh, take on that role of employing individuals. Um, and I think that uh, that's, that's what my role is. Another person asked, and this came from Twitter for what it's worth, uh, what impact will the plan to provide work permits to potentially 300,000 more foreign workers have on uh, the limited number of jobs that are available in the workforce? There are um, obviously some great challenges right now uh, in the job market. and. Our priority is to make sure that uh, citizens here in our country have the opportunity to apply for those jobs. I mean, we've got a lot of jobs that go unfilled um, now. Uh, and let me just give you an example. Agriculture. You hear a lot from farmers and contractors who are saying they can't attract people into these jobs. Well, some of these jobs, quite frankly, uh, pay anywhere from 11, 12, 13, 14 dollars an hour. And I wonder um, why we're not perhaps uh, allowing for more uh, folks that are unemployed that are actually drawing in less through their unemployment check if they were told that there were these jobs available. I, I, I would think that we should, number one, try to do that first before, um, before we necessarily have to go outside of our own uh, country, but we do have programs in place, like the H-2A program, uh, that we've just revamped so that we can minimize abuses in the workforce and allow for a better standard so that everyone complies and you're not also um, somehow disadvantaging 
a competitor that's over here on this side that's actually playing by the rules, paying their taxes, doing everything right, and instead of rewarding another individual who may not be doing any of those things and really hurting our economy and hurting our American workers. Uh, you may have heard the story that came from Hershey PA recently about some foreign students who were being employed in a plant there by a third party uh, and came uh, essentially went on strike recently. Uh, the questioner asks, uh, do you think foreign students should be employed in American industries packing plants uh, or uh, plants that are doing any kind of work such as Hershey? Well, that's one thing of great concern to us right now. So we are currently um, investigating that issue. So I don't want to. Okay, so that's get into a working detail, investigation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think the government should subsidize summer jobs in resorts such as Ocean City for American youth desperately? Uh, that's Maryland. For those of you uh, reading, uh, hearing this from uh, outside uh, the immediate area, seeking summer employment rather than being given almost exclusively to foreign youth especially from Eastern Europe, willing to work for much cheaper wages, live under what in America are substandard conditions? Those are real issues, and that's why we're looking into them. So I, I think that there has been, uh, in the past, some abuse of, of these uh, visa programs, and we're really trying desperately to, to find a balance there, because we know that there are industries that do thrive on, on these uh, individuals that are, that are brought in. But I think um, with this administration, we're really looking at um, providing uh, a better, a better accountability and transparency, and making sure that people are meeting the intent of the law and they're not abusing it. So that's number one. And again, um, we have so many people here, talented individuals that I'm sure would be interested in serving in some of those positions that that pay well. So I, I want to strongly encourage folks to, to to seek those positions. If we can fill them with folks here. Obviously, that's a, that's a priority of ours. Someone asked, what is your vision of apprenticeship and manufacturing in the future, the relationship between those two things? I've actually seen very good labor management uh, apprenticeship programs run throughout the country. And one good example that I see happening that I recently visited in Camp Pendleton was the um, Helmets to Hard Hat program, where you, you're going to see uh, some of our veterans, young vets that are, that are going to be coming home but are still uh, serving, uh, get trained up and get services provided through this uh, apprenticeship program that's being offered. And they can get into different types of trades, whether it's pipe fitting, uh, I mean, all kinds of different activities. And much of it is, sub is subsidized through uh, the private sector and through union dues. Um, it's worked well in some parts of, of the uh, military branches. I hope it can expand, and I hope that more people will take advantage. I've seen that work well. I've seen also um, industries. I, I look at examples with the IBEW, the uh, electrical workers, and some of their contractors, the laborers union and contractors. It's public-private you know, collaborations, or unions. Unions and uh, private industry that come together that, that know how to get things done, that get projects done, that are well-trained, good-paying jobs. So I've seen them work at their best, and I've also heard where perhaps they haven't, where there, there's been some abuses. And of course, we want to rid the system as much as we can of those abuses. Well, we're almost out of time. Uh, before I get to the absolutely last question, I have a couple of housekeeping matters to take care of. I'd like to remind our audience about some upcoming uh, luncheon speakers uh, that we have coming up. Uh, September 6th, the former mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, will talk about uh, the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Uh, that'll be uh, in our ballroom uh, September 29th. Elon Musk, the chief executive of SpaceX, will talk about the future of space flight. And as uh, any of you have been covering or watching that story lately, the International Space Station and whether it can be inhabited by humans in the near term is, is uh, a very pressing question. So that will be uh, a newsworthy event uh, as well. And Ken Burns will be here on October 3rd to talk about prohibition, which is the subject of his uh, next uh, documentary on uh, public broadcasting. Uh, before I get to that last question, Secretary, uh, I'd like uh, to present you with a token of our appreciation, <laughs> truly a token, which is our uh, National Press Club coffee mug. Thank you so much for being here Thank today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Secretary. Right. And my last question is, someone told me that essentially you could write a book that could be titled something along the lines of everything I ever needed to know about government I learned in the state of California. But that, 
you saw so many things taking shape there. I'm just wondering briefly uh, why that was so important that you had that heritage and that experience uh, in the Golden State. I think California is very well represented, uh, representative of what happens throughout our country. You've got rural, you've got inner city, you've got suburbia, you've got um, different types of geographical landscapes, and, and you definitely see dif different economic growth in different sectors of, of our economy, whether it's Silicon Valley, Napa Valley, agribusiness, uh, manufacturing, um, some of the finest institutions of higher learning, and also some of the challenges that we see faced by the unemployed. I, I recall as a member of the House before I even took this position that I saw in my own district uh, at least three years before the recession was actually called a recession, high rates of unemployment manufacturing jobs already leaving and the fact that we could already see a kind of a, a slow a, you know a slow moving economy loss of jobs was already starting to happen and i knew then that there was there was going to be some challenges if i saw it happening in california and in my own district um, i knew that we were we were going to be faced with some major challenges and that serving in the house uh, there in the assembly in the in the senate i was chair of the industrial relations committee where a lot of these labor issues I was confronted with there, um, whether it be dealing with sweatshops or whether it be dealing with um, safety measures and construction, uh, minimum wage issues, health care issues, uh, many things that um, I was privy to to work on, um, I, I was exposed very early on there. Uh, and it's just a continuance now where I am now to see that many of the projects and programs and bills that we crafted or funded or, uh, or what have you, um, I, I had some uh, exposure to uh, while serving in, in the House uh, also as a member of the, of the Congress, but more importantly back in, in uh, Sacramento. I was also a board member, a trustee for a community college. Right now they're one of our major sources of our, our engine of growth, so to speak, for our training programs. So I know those programs very well and I'm very proud, very proud of them. And, I'm very proud to be able to have had such a, a rich experience uh, coming from, from California. How about a round of applause for our speaker today? Thank you. Great <laughs> having you. Thank you, Secretary. I'd like to thank our National Press Club staff, including our Library and Broadcast Center, for organizing today's event. I'd also like to thank our guests from China who uh, have uh, been so kind to visit us here today through Georgetown University. And a reminder that you can find more information about the National Press Club on our website, and you can find that at www.press.org. Thank you, and we're adjourned. Happy Labor Day, everybody. Thank you, Secretary. Labor Secretary. She served in the House for eight years, where her initiatives included affordable health care, protecting the environment, and improving the lives of working families. As an advocate for clean energy jobs, she authored the Green Jobs Act in Congress, which provided funding for job training for veterans, displaced workers, and families in poverty. Before coming to Washington, she served in the California State Assembly and in 1994 made history by becoming the first Hispanic woman elected to the California State Senate. A first-generation American, our guest father was a Teamsters Union shop steward from Mexico who worked at a battery recycling plant, and her mother from Nicaragua was an assembly line worker for Mattel, also a union member. As Labor Secretary, she helped implement major facets of the administration's American Recovery and Reinvestment Act that included increasing and extending unemployment benefits, providing training for workers in need of new skills, and helping to create jobs in clean energy and health information technology. And uh, we don't want to overlook the fact that in the year 2000, she was awarded the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award, which is said to be presented annually to public servants who have made courageous decisions of conscience without regard for the person. So Labor Day is right around the corner. Our guest kindly sits down today with us as the unemployment landscape continues to sh change. A lack of useful skills for new jobs is helping to create a larger pool of unemployed workers. Unions are fighting to maintain their position in the labor force while their public image is said to be at a near all-time low. 
According to the Pew Research Center poll, Americans believe unions have a positive influence on their salaries, their benefits, and their working conditions, but they don't think that unions contribute to productivity or the ability of U.S. companies to compete around the world. And the political season is heating up. I don't have to tell any of you that. Republicans are vying for their party's nomination, and they're hitting the administration hard. For example, Republican Texas Governor Rick Perry said one in six work-eligible Americans cannot find a full-time job. That is not economic recovery, he said. That is economic disaster. The administration has talked about the presiding during the creation of 2.4 million jobs but 14 million people remain unemployed. And we now know that the administration is working on details of a plan to spur job growth with an expected announcement by the president after Labor Day. Secretary Solis is no newcomer to Washington before becoming... Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Mark Hamrick, a broadcast journalist with the Associated Press, and I'm the 104th president of the National Press Club. I'd like to welcome our club members and their guests here in the audience today, as well as those of you watching live on C-SPAN and listening over any variety of broadcast audiences. I'd also like to remind our audience that members of the public are in attendance here today, so if you hear applause by chance, it's not necessarily evidence that our journalist members have checked their impartiality at the door. Now, before we get started with our special guest today, I want to thank Jennifer Schonberger from Kiplinger's, who's over here uh, on our front row. She's a member of our Speakers Committee who did an excellent job bringing today's event together. Thank you very much, Jennifer. As we all know, America is facing the worst jobs crisis since the Great Depression. The official unemployment rate stands at 9.1 percent. The so-called real unemployment rate, which includes discouraged workers, is a little over 16 percent. And of the unemployed, 30 percent have been out of work for more than a year. The percentage of American adults in the workforce has dropped to 58 percent, and we're told that's the lowest rate since 1983. Personal or professional consequences. So first of all, I'd ask our audience to please give a warm, traditional round of applause to our speaker today, Labor Secretary Hilda Solis. <laughs> Secretary, thank you for sitting down with us at this important time. It's an important week. As we noted, uh, we have the holiday uh, coming up on Monday. We have what we call uh, in the uh, business and financial field Numbers Day on Friday, which is the monthly unemployment statistics. And as we know, the President, uh, both yesterday and today, has been referencing uh, ways to help uh, cure what seems to be a much more uh, substantial unemployment problem than maybe many of us had expected that would be persistent this long after the uh, financial crisis. So we know the President is going to make a speech uh, of some kind, and I presume that you have been uh, working very closely with him and uh, the White House on uh, that plan. Uh, there have been some drips and drabs coming out on that. What can you tell us about uh, what we can expect at this point? Well, Mark, I don't certainly want to go ahead of the president and the drips and, you know, inkling of information that comes out. I think uh, the public is, is aware that the president is very concerned about job creation, as well as I am. I mean, that's been our priority since day one. Um, and I think we've learned in the last two and a half years uh, what will work, what can work. And one of the things that he's talked about already was extending the payroll uh, tax that uh, will help millions of people and help put some discretionary funding uh, out there that will help spur uh, some job creation. That's one part of it. The other would be to extend the unemployment insurance benefit program that helps to provide a safety net for millions of people who are still looking for jobs. And I have a lot of empathy for those five workers to one job that are looking for entry into the workforce. We can't, uh, we can't fault them. They lost their jobs through no fault of their own. And we owe them uh, as much support as we can to help them transition into new jobs. So it's very important that unemployment insurance be used as a, as a tool that can help people uh, reinvent themselves, get retrained, get new certification, and be able to find the means of getting into that, to that job. And then the other thing I would say is very 